So students, if you want to join us on Friday at one o'clock with Judge McKee, um, that is that last link I just put in the chat. If you want to check out that class, um, he is a fantastic judge, an amazing speaker, a great historian, um, and happens to be our next door neighbor in Philadelphia. At least his work is our next door neighbor. <laughs> So four more minutes and we will get started. We're gonna look at slavery in America this week. That's the topic of the week, looking from a little bit pre-constitution all the way to the 13th amendment. It looks like my video is still still blocked, Curry. Yeah, um, let me hold. Okay, I'm now host. I can get, I can start giving, doling out power. Excellent. <laughs> you, can I, demote, I, you, you can demote me then too. Uh, that's a diff <laughs> different kinds of power, right? Negative and positive power. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Bye, Scott. Thank you. There we go. I try to dole out power freely and equally, like equally and all over the place. Three more minutes. Warren's here yet because I wanted to talk to him about uh, Martha Jones because Warren and I were like in our heyday on Friday. <laughs> he's like, we're li he's literally messaging me. I can't wait till she tells this story. I'm like, me neither. <laughs> plus, uh, plus, I think she's on Jeff's podcast this week too. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yeah. Her, first of all, choices of stories, ability to tell a story, but also like what I found fascinating was her ability to tell a well-rounded story in the perfect amount of time. Like that is a crazy skill. Like I have never seen anybody that good. Like she like kind of could gauge the audience, but like the story type and like gave it the perfect amount of time. So it never felt too short or, or too long. It was really impressive, really crazy impressive. <laughs> and uh, I just, I just know I learned a ton from her birthright citizens book. So that's the, that's the one before this yep. one. And it's just so good about African-Americans fighting for their rights, especially before the civil war. And I think it was Lainey on Friday. She was like best Friday to date. And I'm like, I'm with you Lainey. <laughs> Every week I say that though. So it's very fun. So welcome everybody to class. We've got two more minutes before we get started. Uh, so if there's any questions, feel free to ask them. We're going to start off with kind of big questions for ourselves today. So I'll put those in the chat. So I always like to, I'm a reader, so I like to see them for a long period of time. And I will also share some links. So there are worksheets and briefing documents and all these awesome tools that we put on our website around this class. You can find them in that first link. And then if you want to join us Friday at one o'clock where Judge Theodore McKee will be joining us as our guest speaker of the week. He's fantastic and he'll be there. So that's the second link that I share. One more minute. Like, don't leave me, Tom. <laughs> Just replenishing my coffee. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I moved on to the Diet Coke today. This is the kind of day it's going to be. <laughs> So if, I, if I'm really spazzy in class, blame it on the Diet Coke. <laughs> okay, everybody, we are officially going to get started. Welcome everybody, so excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today's class is all about slavery in America. We're gonna be looking at the colonial period in America through the Constitution and of course the Declaration of Independence all the way through the Reconstruction Amendments and absolutely engaging in the 13th Amendment that ends slavery in the Constitution. For this conversation today, we are here with one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly. Tom, you wanna say hi to everybody? Hi everyone, welcome. So we're excited for this class. We are gonna be recording it, but we also love questions. And we know this is a tricky and difficult topic and there's so many pieces to it. So feel free as we go through class to share ideas, thoughts, and questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'll be checking both places. Now, Tom, as we kind of engage in this topic and look closely, you know, we propose big questions for ourselves when writing this class and we wanted to share them with our students. So some of the big questions really look at how slavery was embedded into America's fabric 
through the ratification of the constitution in 1787. And the question that we ponder is because of this, does this make slavery stay even longer in America and end in a bloody civil war? How are those connections between how it is a part of our country and the length of it in our country? Do, are they connected? Are they not connected? Or in which ways? Usually with so many of these questions, it's not just a simple yes or no answer. It's complicated. And that's a good thing we learn about the constitution and our history. Second question looks at the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. And if you guys didn't know, you now know that this is Tom Donnelly's favorite area and to really dive into. But when we think about these amendments, we think of the great changes that they do to our country and the changes to the constitution. So many scholars ponder this question and we want you to ponder it as well. Are these such a change to our constitution that we should consider them a second founding, just like the colonial period in the constitution of 1787 is the first founding, would this be considered a second founding? So some big ideas to ponder as we dive into this complex and difficult topic of slavery in America. So Tom, let's start before we're a country in the colonial period. How does slavery almost work in the world? And then how does it change in America um, or the colonies um, with the law and the infrastructure and kind of how does the system change over time? So take us in there and then we're gonna go to the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, Curry, so the, the slavery itself is obviously older than the constitution. The institution of slavery itself was there, it was around for centuries upon centuries before America existed. Um, but you're right, there's a way in which the American experience, the experience of the American colonies transforms the institution itself in very important ways. So slavery is written into the colonial laws all the way back to you know, the 1660s really, in Virginia, in the Carolinas. And so slavery there, it's, it's, it's a part of the culture in these colonies, but it's also a, car, a part of the law. So it's culture and law together. But what we see is that by the 1700s, these colonial slave codes transformed the institution of slavery itself. The most important thing it did, and it's what created just the brutal slave system that we had here, was that it made slavery inheritable. So this meant that it was a condition. It was a condition that was associated with race. So we're talking about African-Americans here in the South. And it's a, it's a condition that parents passed on to children. It's a condition that couldn't really be changed. And so when, we, when you hear the, the, the concept of chattel slavery, chattel slavery, this is what we mean. And it's, it's, tra it's transforming the institution of slavery, a very old institution, into one that is linked to race and that is linked to a certain condition that is passed on from parent to child. I'll sort of pause there uh, before we move on. Yeah, and I think that is hugely important when we're trying to understand this in the context of America, but in the globe and the world as well, because we have these conversations sometimes about slavery in the world, but it is different in America. And the idea that you could never break free from it because it is connected to who you are and passed down from mother to child is, is invented at this point and changes everything. And that really changes the dynamics of the slave trade as well. Uh, international slave trade as well, and the growth of it in America. So there, all these things are connected. So when we look at this, it is a really looking at the system that is embedded into our country and how that is organized by law, by culture, I love that you pointed that out, and by economy as well. Um, and here's the part that I always get kind of really like stuck on. We're a country that's founded on this idea of the American Revolution, you know, this a beautiful idea of natural rights that there is no government that can ever take away your natural rights. But slavery feels like such a hypocrisy when we say things like that. So weave us into the declaration time period. And was this an opportunity for change that almost happened or didn't happen? Yeah, so I mean, what's what's interesting about this moment is, you know, where we're, so if we fast forward to the Declaration of Independence, 1776, we're a little bit over a decade before we will have our new U.S. Constitution, but even before the Constitutional Convention, before the Constitution itself, we see these two big things clashing. Th the, these, the, the, on the one hand, the institution of slavery. On the other hand, the nation's founding principles as written into the Declaration of Independence. And this conflict in so many ways into the Constitutional Convention, 
into all of those decades in the 1800s before the Civil War to the Civil War itself, and then the battle over Reconstruction after the Civil War, they end up being big debates over slavery and you know whether or not we can reconcile that institution with our deepest principles as embodied in the Declaration. And so the Declaration of Independence itself, written by Thomas Jefferson, a, 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 you know, a, a slaveholder himself, um, uh, on the, on the one hand, we see Jefferson, as he's writing the Declaration, actually trying to get in the Declaration itself language that denounces the international slave trade. And so we see here powerful language where Jefferson himself, again, a slaveholder, speaking out about against the immorality and the horrors of the international slave trade, blaming it on, you know, blaming basically King George III embedding this into America and that America becomes complicit then in this immoral trade uh, but what we see all the way there, all the way at the beginning in 1776 with the declaration is you see important slaveholding delegates from states like South Carolina forcing Jefferson to eliminate this language. So we delete this language from the Declaration of Independence, these specific arguments against the international slave trade, um, in, in, in effect, acquiescing to these Southern slaveholders. But in many ways, the most important thing about the Declaration of Independence here is that it does commit the nation to certain principles that we all know, you know, know by heart. We've read them so many times, we know them by heart today, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and eventually all women are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what this ends up doing from the very beginning is that it gives deep principles for those who see the evils of slavery to appeal to. To say, America, you are not living up to your principles, and it doesn't matter if it's 1776, 1830, 1850, you see advocates of abolition saying, now is the time to embrace the Declaration of Independence. You know, a great example right around the Declaration, Curry, is Prince Hall. Mm -hmm. So the example of Prince Hall, it's 1777, he's a free African-American in Boston, he's active in the African-American community there, and what he does is he puts together a petition to the Massachusetts legislature on behalf of seven African-Americans. And what he says is six months ago, we had this Declaration of Independence. It states our commitment to liberty and equality. It's that these are God-given rights given to everyone. Of course, slavery is inconsistent with the Declaration. It's inconsistent with natural rights. And because of that, Massachusetts should turn away from slaveholding. And what's amazing about this early moment, Korea, it's a, it's a reminder that you know, slavery is an institution that is deeply embedded in the South, but it exists in Northern states as well. And so we do begin to see these early pushes towards abolition in, in Northern states. This example in Massachusetts being, you know, by, what is it, 1783, the Massachusetts Supreme Court embraces Prince Hall's argument. It says, of course, slavery is inconsistent with natural rights. It's inconsistent with the Declaration. It's inconsistent with the Massachusetts Constitution. And so the Massachusetts Supreme Court strikes down the practice. And so we'll see those sorts of arguments play out all throughout the 1800s. And, and I find it like this fascinating, like at odds between what we write and what we do. And it, like when I think about this, you know, nobody better encompasses that than Jefferson. <laughs> like he's the one that writes this and still yet enslaves people and and frees very very few of his enslaved people and so I think there's this almost this constant like struggle and battle going on with who we think we are and who we are in our actions and so when we get to the constitutional convention and we see uh, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia saying oh we're going for gradual abolition we have to really dig into this because it's also how gradual is gradual because I, I think it's like enslaved people will not be fully free in um, Philadelphia until 1850s. So it's really gradual. Um, that's right before the Civil War at some point, it's really shocking. So we're seeing these changes, but it is constantly at odds. And do we see that at the convention, this battle in between what we believe and what we do and how does it play out between North and South, but how does it play out in the constitution as well? In the yeah, we see the yeah no, we see these debates open up at the Constitutional Convention, and you're right, Curry. It's it is always hard to wrestle with what do we do with the Declaration of Independence? What do we make of even that moment itself? Because on the one hand, we can never turn away from the horrors of the institution of slavery, and we know that it's going to exist for nearly a century more because we know how American history plays out. On the other hand, the ideas in that document really, really, really mattered. I mean, they really did give a platform for all of the 
courageous voices between the Declaration and the Civil War fighting for an end to slavery. So it, it's just, we, it, it's, it's always tough to wrestle with both of those ideas and hold them both in our heads, but I think they're both quite important. Um, you know, as we get to the Constitutional Convention, I think the big takeaway here is that the, the framers, on the one hand, they really did work hard to make sure that the Constitution didn't clearly establish a right to property and men, a right to hold enslaved people. And so that's, you don't see the word slavery in the Constitution, and you don't see clear expressions of that right in there. At the same time, what we also see is that even Northern delegates who were critics of slavery were willing to compromise over the institution of slavery in order to get slaveholding states to join the new national government, to get them to support the constitution. And so we see a push and pull at the convention between a certain number of anti-slavery voices and then very strong voices from the slaveholding South, especially from the deep South states like Georgia, states like South Carolina. And so we see this series of compromises that do concede a certain amount of political power to the slaveholding delegates in the slaveholding states. Should we tick through them quickly, Curry? Yeah, I was gonna say, let's look at these compromises because you're right, again, it's this, and we have to, when understanding and learning American history, we have to look at both sides at the same time. And sometimes we try to compartmentalize them and say good, bad, but we really need to see that they're intertwined. And so three-fifths compromise, it, it feels like all bad to me, but when you really break down the history, it was a compromise between the two. You know, that's, that's absolutely right. And let's begin with the, the, the three-fifths clause, because in many ways, it's arguably the most important, practically speaking, of these compromises. And so to understand the three-fifths clause, remember, when we're determining how many seats a state is going to get in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, what we look to is that state's population. So the, the bigger your population is a state, the more seats you get in the House of Representatives. And of course, the more seats that you have in the House of Representatives, the more power you have in Congress. And so you can even think of this, the more seats that a particular region of the country, the North versus the South, the free states versus the slaveholding states are going to define political power within Congress. And what we see here is a debate over, as we're making those calculations of state population, what do we do with enslaved people? How do we count them for purposes of how many seats a particular state is going to get? And what we see among slaveholding delegates is count our enslaved people as five fifths, as a full person for purposes of representation in Congress, even though they will give, give enslaved people no rights, say nothing of the right to vote, no rights at all no that right. we cherish. Um, but they will still argue that for purposes of seats in Congress, they should count as full people. The flip side being you have anti-slavery delegates arguing that these enslaved people should count for zero fifths, calling out slaveholding delegates for being hypocrites, saying, how is it that you can count enslaved people as full persons for purposes of determining seats in Congress, but still argue that you can treat them as property within the institution of slavery? And so here, a really powerful voice, Curry, is the delegate from uh, is the delegate Governor Morris, who's a powerful anti-slavery voice, and he argues that slavery is a nefarious institution, the curse of heaven on the states where it prevails. And he attacks the three-fifths clause, and this is great language, for giving, quote, the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity, tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and dooms them to the most cruel bondages, more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizens of Pennsylvania who view with a lot of horror so nefarious a practice. And so from that, you can get a sense, Curry, we're talking about passionate arguments here at certain times about slavery. In the end, the convention comes around to a compromise and they say, no, we're not gonna count enslaved people as five fifths. We're not gonna count them as zero fifths. We will count them as three fifths. And once again, it's Connecticut's Roger Sherman in, lot, in many ways, the deal maker at the convention brokering this three fifths compromise. And here's the part that's, okay, first of all, I love Governor Morris. And if anybody knows me, you'll know I'm obsessed with him. Um, and so it's fascinating to read his speeches on this and he speaks out over and over and over again. But three fifths, so they compromise on this. But in the long run, well, now we can look back on, in hindsight, how much power does this give to the slaveholding states to hold on to slavery? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it boosts their power in Congress by counting enslaved people as three fifths of a person, which in turn boosts their power in the Electoral College, because that's connected to the number of seats you have in Congress, so that it shapes who becomes president, which in turn shapes who ends up on the Supreme Court, because the president is appointing who's on the Supreme Court. So it really is a provision that reverberates. But of course, you know, the, the, the counter argument for the delegates who brokered this compromise was, 
without compromises like this, there would not have been a union. And so it is, it's a very tricky balancing act to figure out, you know, what do we in the end make of these compromises that, that it, with what we term to be absolute evil, looking back historically. Abs yeah, and I think that's, it was almost, a, it was breaking up the convention. The convention was ready to dissolve <laughs> at this point um, over these compromises, but also over the, the discussion about enslavement. So there's two other clauses in the, the, found, the original constitution, that structural constitution, the fugitive slave clause and the slave trade clause. So can we kind of look at these two as well? Sure, so the fugitive slave clause uh, gave power to slaveholders to go into free states to retrieve pe uh, people who they say were slaves who escaped, enslaved people who escaped to freedom. And so this language you see on the screen, it comes from the Northwest Ordinance, uh, which was something put together by Congress in the 1780s, determining what do we do with the Northwest Territories and slavery. Well, what they said there is that one, we're gonna ban slavery from the Northwest Territories, but two, we are going to give slaveholders the power to retrieve enslaved people that they accuse of escaping slavery when they go into free territories. And so here, what the delegates are doing is writing that particular power into the constitution. Because it comes from the Northwest Ordinance, it's language that they're used to, uh, there isn't a lot of debate over this clause. Although this clause would open up great, great struggles in the 1800s as Northern states became increasingly critical of slavery and increasingly refused uh, to be complicit in any way in helping slaveholders retrieve enslaved people that escaped into free territory. And the slave trade clause. Yeah, this is the final big compromise, and this is a debate over what sort of power does Congress have to ban the international slave trade. We have some delegates like, uh, like, like uh, John Dickinson and um, uh, uh, George Mason arguing that now is the time in the Constitution to ban the international slave trade. It's evil. It's immoral. This is our time to start on a new baseline and say not in America. We will not be complicit in the international slave trade. Well, we, at the same time, we see slaveholding states arguing, well, if you do that, we're not going to join the union. We are not going to support this government. And so once again, we see a compromise. So they, the, the delegates end up agreeing to this, this particular clause, which uh, bans Congress, which says Congress cannot ban the international slave trade until 1808. So before then, the international slave trade will be open. Beginning in 1808, Congress can ban it. And Congress did. But this opened up an additional 20 years of the international slave trade in the United States. And it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable the amount of humans that are stolen um, and, and forced into slavery in America during this 20 years. It's a big impact. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, so it had a great practical, a great practical uh, effect. So when we think about this, um, we think, you know, they allow all these ways that slavery is into the new constitution, into our structure, but there is instantly resistance. I mean, we talked about Prince Hall even before this, but there is instantly resistance with the abolitionist movement. So how quickly does this kind of energize and what kind of power does the abolitionist movement have in the late 1700s? And then how does it start to change in the 1840s getting towards the Civil War? Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing to realize is with, we saw with the Prince Hall example, anti-slavery arguments are there from the very beginning. They're there before the Constitution with the first Congress. You know, a very famous example is Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin works. He's the president of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. He turns against slavery in uh, near the end of his life, becomes an outspoken critic of the institution. And so what happens when the first Congress meets? Benjamin Franklin greets the first Congress with a petition calling on Congress to end slavery, or at the very least to end the international slave trade. This opens up a debate about slavery in the first Congress from the very beginning. Now it doesn't have a practical effect. Congress doesn't act on these petitions, but you could see the debates there in Congress from the very beginning. You know, as we're getting into the 1800s and we have you know, this powerful gallery of abolitionists here on the screen, you know, one thing to note is you see within the abolitionist movement um, a division over how do we even think about the constitution? Some of them argue the Constitution's a pro-slavery document, uh, document. Some of them argue that it's an anti-slavery document. We'll get to some of those constitutional debates in a little bit. But practically speaking, it's useful just to walk through these five individuals just to get a sense of the breadth of the movement. Because the images alone suggest something so important about the abolitionist movement. You know, one thing, it's both men and women. Two, the second thing is that it's both African-Americans and white Americans joining together in the abolitionist cause, joining together to try to end slavery in the United States. 
And so here going across, you know, beginning on, uh, you know, at the left here, that, you know, that's Harriet Tubman, who, you know, as a formerly enslaved person becomes a powerful and courageous figure in the Underground Railroad, bringing enslaved people to freedom in the North. The second person right there is, uh, is uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, well, I didn't know which way you were going. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go in order across. It's hard to choose even where to go next. <laughs> I know. But, you know this is Harriet Beecher Stowe, who, of course, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which would have a great influence on Northern public opinion in the 1850s, turning it against slavery and also really angering many white Southerners. Person in the middle is in many ways the most controversial figure here. This is John Brown, who was an abolitionist who, you know, led a, a, ra a raid in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, trying to secure the, the, the national arsenal to then begin to try, try to inspire a massive revolution among enslaved people in the South. And he was ultimately stopped, apprehended and executed for that. Um, and so became this important lightning rod where he, he terrified white Southerners. I mean, this seemed to take the abolitionist cause to a new level. And you know, among abolitionists, opinion divided as to whether he was a prophet or whether he had gone too far. And uh, he says next, that, he says the, oh, like, he acknowledges he's taking it to a violent level, but is saying that he is brought to this point by this violence that the only way to stop it is to do this. So it's a fascinating look at yeah. um, kind of that balance between protest and nonviolent protest and violent protest. Well, and so many of the abolitionists were, you know, driven by their faith. They were Christians and they were pacifists. And so a lot of them really had to ask that big philosophical question about like, you know, when, you know, when do the ends justify the means? And, you know, those sorts of debates remain with us to this day. The next person on the list there is Angelina Grimke. And so she and her sister, Sarah, were both important abolitionists. Um, they were actually born in South Carolina. So they're notable for being white Southerners who then moved to the North and become important abolitionist voices, both in their writings and in their speaking. And the last person there is Sojourner Truth. So she's another formerly enslaved person. Um, she emerges as a really important speaker um, on the abolitionist speaking circuit. She also becomes a noted suffragist pushing for women's rights. So we see this across many of the voices in the abolitionist movement. They're broadly committed to reform, both to bring rights to African-Americans and to women. And so Sojourner Truth was very much a voice there. Um, but again, across from this, the bottom line, we see an interracial group. We see a group of both men and women fighting to end slavery. The, you know, if we're looking for the trend over time, this is very, very unpopular. This is a very unpopular argument throughout a lot of the 1800s. And so the people who are speaking out on behalf of abolitionism are doing it with great courage. They're meeting, they, you know, they, they're often met with yelling, violence, you name it. And so there's a way in which we can look back at the abolitionists and say, clearly, truth was on their side, right was on their side. It must be inevitable they're going to win out. But they had to have the courage to fight for those beliefs. And, you know, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Carrie, I'll, I'll pause right there. And yet, when we talk about what they're fighting for and the, their beliefs and the ending of slavery and the violence and the moral wrong of slavery, um, when we think about this, we we say, how do we change it? How do we fix it? And there's there's almost like two camps. There's the, the constitution is a pro-slavery document and needs to get thrown out. And then the other camp, which is the constitution is an anti-slavery document and we need to amend it to ensure that slavery will end or we need to make sure we live up to its ideals. So that always leads me to these two gentlemen, which again, I, it's fascinating because when you read their letters and read your stories, you're on board. You're like, yes, I'm totally on board with you. And then Frederick Douglass, who was once on board with it being a uh, pro-slavery document, really looks at it differently than everybody else and says, no, this is how we evolve as a country and finally live up to our founding principles. So can you dive into that conversation as well? Yeah, again, this is a reminder that these, these debates are often constitutional debates. These are important abolitionists fighting over what is the proper meaning of the constitution. So William Lloyd Garrison is an important voice, emerges in you know, the 1830s especially, arguing for immediate emancipation. So a lot of political leaders wanna say, let's do gradual emancipation, let's move slowly. And, and Harrison says, the moral wrong here, uh, you know, has to, it, it has to lead to immediate emancipation. And what he says powerfully is he says that the constitution ultimately is a pro-slavery document. In this sense, he ends up agreeing with key slaveholding voices like John C. Calhoun. And so Garrison and his supporters, they burn constitutions. 
you know, ha, you know uh, William Lloyd Garrison himself says that the Constitution is a, quote, covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And he says, what you need to do if you're a real abolitionist is don't work with the corrupt political parties. The only way we're going to get abolition and immediate emancipation is by reforming people's souls. And so his was very much a movement to try to change public opinion. But in that sense, he embraced the same sorts of constitutional arguments you would find in among the, the, the pro-slavery voices. And in response, we see the powerful words of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass himself, who began as a Garrisonian, but he was convinced. He, he was convinced to change his mind, convinced by important abolitionist writers like Lysander Spooner, that the Constitution was not a pro-slavery document, but in fact, as he said, as, as, as Frederick Douglass said, it is a glorious liberty document, which I love that quote, it's so powerful. And so what he basically says is, just look at the text of the Constitution. First, just do that. There is no mention of slavery and we shouldn't go around looking at old records to try to find a way to read the Constitution in a pro-slavery way. We should take the Constitution as it's written. And as it's written, there are so many ways in which it bends towards liberty. Look at the preamble of the Constitution. The preamble of the Constitution, its basic promises explaining why we have a Constitution about you know, advancing the blessings of liberty, the general welfare. Those, those, those sorts of commitments point us in the direction of emancipation not slavery. Furthermore, key provisions like the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment protect life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And that these sorts of protections of life, liberty, and property, where are they violated most? They're violated most in the case of enslaved people who have every single one of their God-given rights taken away from them through the institution of slavery. And so Douglas has these power, I have a quote here from Douglas that really captures the power here. So he's talking about the preamble and he said, it's language is we the people, not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people. If the South has made the constitution bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. And here you see the dividing line between the Garrisonians and Douglas. And, and I love this. And I, going back to that original question is, can we align with what we say and what we do Douglas calls on people that support him on his Fourth of July speech and says, "This document, this for, this this document is beautiful, but you are the hypocrites. You're the ones not living up to its words." And so I love this kind of saying, "We have a document of freedom, but it can only be a document of freedom if we use it for freedom." So uh, I'm totally charged up. So let's keep going. <laughs> let's kind of move through and kind of some other freedom fighters that really kind of move us towards the Thirteenth Amendment. And I'm kind of going to cruise through really quickly to the Scots. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and that's, that, it's so powerful to think of Douglas together with the Scots, together with another thing that's happening during this period and into the Civil War and through Reconstruction, or African Americans are meeting in convention state by state. So not just saying live up to the commitments of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but if you really, really want to commit to equality for African Americans, here are the, the sorts of rights and liberties that we need, rights to free speech, to religious liberty, to the right to keep and bear arms, the right to equality, the right to protection. And so you see them advancing this vision that will eventually be written in the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. But Harriet and Dred Scott are an important part of this story. So they are enslaved people. It's 18, the Dred Scott decision is in many ways, perhaps the most infamous, most important decision the Supreme Court issues about slavery. It ends up, it's decided in 1857 and Harriet and Dred Scott are enslaved people. They were brought on to free soil. So they were taken onto free soil by the slaveholder. And what they argue is, beginning with, with Harriet Scott's petition, with Dred Scott joining it, they argue that we are free. And why do they care? They have two young daughters. They have two young daughters that they don't want to see live within the institution of slavery. So they argue we are free because we were brought on free soil. And the Supreme Court says no. In an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Brooktani, he says three big things. One, African-Americans are not United States citizens. Two, African-Americans had, quote, no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. And three, Congress does not have power to limit slavery in the territories. And in doing that, basically declared unconstitutional the political platform of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, the first true anti-slavery party of the major parties in the United States. And so with Dred Scott, it hits like a thunderbolt. Republicans like Lincoln are highly critical of the Dred Scott opinion. And of course, as we know, Famously, President uh, Abraham Lincoln wins the presidency in 1860, 1860, and then the war comes. 
And then the war comes, um, Lincoln kind of pivots from the beliefs he has on the way to end slavery in the beginning to where, where, he, end, where he winds up at the end of the war and during his second um, run for presidency. Can, so can you really quickly, I know we're like a minute over, but kind of pivot us through where Lincoln starts and where he ends? Yeah, so Lincoln begins as a boy. He, he always believes slavery is immoral, always says that quite clearly, and really struggles with how do we get from a society where we have an institution of slavery intent entrenched to one where we no longer have slavery. And so he embraces gradual emancipation. He, he embraces compensated emancipation. So that means if slaveholders uh, free the enslaved people, they would then get money for that, just as they would any other form of property. What we see from Lincoln, and you can see this powerfully in Eric Foner's scholarship, in particular his book, The Fiery Trial, is that Lincoln has a capacity to hear arguments from people who disagree with him, key figures like Frederick Douglass, and change his mind, but also respond to the events that are unfolding before him. This is a time of rapid change, a time of great peril for the nation. And so his views on the proper way to approach slavery change. And we see this during the Civil War. So we end with the 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery. But during the Civil War itself, we see the Republican Party, we see Lincoln taking important steps to end slavery. And so, you know, we see Congress basically ignoring Dred Scott and abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia and in the territories. We, of course, see African-Americans themselves laying claim to freedom, escaping from the plantations in the South, fleeing to Union lines, many of them eventually signing up to be Union soldiers and willing to give their lives, to shed their blood for the promise of freedom, equality, and to preserve the Union. And so this plays an important role in turning the opinion of Lincoln and many other Republicans to really commit much more to a vision of equal rights for African-Americans. And then finally, Lincoln himself issues the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863. And so one thing to note about the Emancipation Proclamation is, you know, he's using his war powers to do this. You know, Lincoln would have said prior to the Civil War, no, the national government doesn't have the power to end slavery in the Southern states where it exists, but he's effectively doing that with the Emancipation Proclamation saying, this is a war measure. I am the commander in chief of our military and under that power, I have the power to do this. And so what he does is he frees enslaved people in, uh, in, in, that are held in the Confederacy. Now, this doesn't affect enslaved people in the border states loyal to the Union, like Maryland and Kentucky. But nevertheless, this is such a radical change from anything anyone would have expected before the Civil War. So it's a major step towards the path of abolishing slavery, but it's not the final step. And Lincoln himself would have been the first to say this. So the Civil War, we get through the Civil War, the Union ultimately wins the Civil War. But what Lincoln does and what he understands is that to put emancipation on firm constitutional ground throughout the nation, we need a constitutional amendment. And so his concern is there's really no way under the old constitution to simply abolish slavery through the national government. He was concerned that even the Emancipation Proclamation itself fell under the president's war powers. And because of that, maybe on shaky constitutional footing once there is no longer a war. And so he fought hard after his reelection in 1864 for congressional approval of the 13th Amendment. And with the 13th Amendment, he ultimately lobbies, secures congressional approval. When Congress approves it, he, even though he has no formal role in the amendment process, signs his name to the bottom of the, the draft of the 13th Amendment that's sent to the state for ratification, and he famously calls it a king's cure for the evils of slavery. And so we'll pause there with the 13th Amendment. It's ratified in December 1865. He wouldn't live to see the ratification day, um, but it's a, it's a powerful moment at the beginning of this second American founding. And again, I'm trying to ensure that a way to end this isn't just by state action or by feelings, but by amending the constitution, adding into the document and then calling on the people to live up to this. Next week, we're gonna dive deeply into, did we live up to this? And how do we see from the 13th amendment, the changes with the 14th and the 15th amendment, and then from the reconstruction time period in the 18, late 1860s, to modern times. So really kind of a two-part conversation. But Tom, thank you so much for kind of getting our understanding around these big ideas and this, you know, this almost like split way that we see our history, but the way that when we put it all together, that's our whole history and understanding America for all the pieces around it. So I have a couple more questions at the end, but I know some of our students have to jump. So students, if you have to jump, jump. If not, we're going to hold for questions right after this. So let me end the